All right. Thank all for coming out on this evening. Um, if I could, my people in the back for me, if you could hear me clap once. Oh, if you could hear me clap once. If you could hear me clap twice. All right, I need my fellows in the back. I know it's a wonderful conversation, but let's like tone that down by like 50%, all right? Thank you, thank you. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I know you all really wanna hear from the panel and all the answers that they have. Um, first and foremost, we're gonna do a little introduction. And so these people in particular, they have an introduction that's, that's beyond the page itself, but I wanna read off a few. First is Dr. Uh, Ellen Dunham Jones here at uh, Georgia Tech. She is a professor. Uh, she directs the Masters of Science in Urban Design program at uh, Georgia Tech. She is also the host of the Designing Cities podcast. She is the co-author with June Williamson of two time of two award-winning books. One is Retro Sub Retrofitting Suburbia. Um, also, her documentation of successful redevelopments, reuses, and regreening of aging auto-dominated properties into more healthier, sustainable places. She has been featured in the New York Times. She's done a TED Talk. She's been featured at NPR, PBS, BBC, and yada, yada, yada. I know she's she she's more modest than she is, but her resume speaks for itself. So again, Dr. Ellen Dunham Jones. All right. Our next person is uh, Stephanie Wolfgang over here. She is the current UDC chair. She is a landscape architect. She in particular believes that Landscapes are never static and meant to, and never not meant to be. They are powerful storytelling tools that change and adapt to the seasons and new histories. Her landscape designs that retain a sense of wonder and since 2012, she has worked to tell stories about places in Atlanta. She is a leader in combining landscape and storytelling. Stephanie sets a standard for landscapes recontextualizing spaces that they beautify beyond aesthetics. So give it up for Stephanie over here. Our next one over here is Oscar Harris. He is a, give it up for Oscar, everyone. Oscar is an architect in particular. He is a, not only an architect, he's also an author, a mentor, and an artist. He is recognized as one of the most influential businessmen and prominent architects in the South. He has had a successful career spanning over 40 years. As a serial entrepreneur, Harris has created hundreds of career opportunities for aspiring professionals through Turner Associates, OLH International, International Aviation Consultants, and the Atlanta Center for Creative Inquiry, and now Spike Studio. So once again, give it up for Oscar. <laughs> Last but not least, representing the city of Atlanta, we have Kenyatta Holmes. Kenyatta is a Georgia and Atlanta native. She joined the city of Atlanta's uh, Department of City Planning in 2017. She is the Director of Zoning and Development, the Zoning Administration, I'm sorry, Administrator and Manages Zoning, Land Development and Strategic Planning before Joining the city, Kenyatta was a senior planner with the city of East Point, responsible for comprehensive planning and the project manager for two zoning code revisions. So give it up. I, I was gonna say it. So I'm sorry about this. I got your name wrong. My brain is always gonna say Kenyatta, so I apologize. Kenyatta, Kenyatta, Kenyatta. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. All right, so once again, give it up for Kenyatta Holmes. And so I was actually surprised. We have quite a few questions from the audience. And so before we get into everything, I do have one question for all of you. And it's a question that either one of you can answer or none of you can answer if you don't want to. So when it comes to Atlanta, we have a few questions prior to this that I want to read off from people who cannot attend tonight. And so the first question for all of you is the following. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, we got some good ones. So all right. This is not too hard. What would you say? is the best looking part of the city of Atlanta, of the city of Atlanta. So again, what would you say is the best looking part of the city of Atlanta? Whoever wants to go first. Hi, this is Turn it on. Oh, there are just so many. It's impossible to name only one. But the one problem, I uh, gave up my car nine years ago I only bike to get around. I, mean, I actually, I borrowed my husband's car to um, drive here tonight for some other reasons. But So I do drive on occasion, but I don't get to, when you're cycling, you get to meet people and you get to see things at a slower speed and that you really appreciate. So I feel like in many ways, my world view of Atlanta has deepened, but it's also, I mean, I, 
it's, it, I've lost. I don't get out to a lot of other neighborhoods and see a lot of other, of other places. Uh, also, I think, so my own experience of what I think where Atlanta looks best is when I can cycle happily, free, you know, not being too overly worried. I still have my helmet and all my lights on, but in, on a street where there, that is, where I see more people than cars, people on their porches, walking under the, walking dogs under trees, streets that um, are welcoming, conducive, safe, and, and happy. And I feel like actually what's so great about Atlanta is so many of our neighborhood streets are like that. I also absolutely love our main streets uh, all, uh, that most of our, especially the streetcar suburbs, really kind of developed uh, not quite naturally. And so rather than name individuals, I'm, I'm kind of giving the types. Okay. Anybody else want to answer that? Not all at once. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'm going to say plants and coffee in East Atlanta Village um, because, you know, for me, that's a place that we go pretty much every Saturday. It's not like there's anything mind-blowing about the space, but there's such good people watching, right? It's a place where you go, you get a good coffee, you can see some cute plants that you're never going to buy because they're too expensive, but they're really interesting. And and you can, you know, watch other people have like constant interactions with their neighbors they know, and you, and you can either be part of that or you can just observe. You see street life. Um, I went there with my baby when she was five days old. You know, it becomes part of our routine and our memories, and I think that's what's important about what is a beautiful space in Atlanta is, is that it's embedded in, in good memories for those who occupy it. Kiata? What was the question again? <laughs> what question is the best is, neighborhood? What is the best looking neighborhood? No, specifically, what street in Atlanta do you think looks the best? You can define it how you want. Yeah, so I don't think that a street, one street looks better than the other one. I think that all of the streets bring something unique to whichever part of the city that it serves. I, we have very um, diverse and unique neighborhoods that create our city, and each one of them, to me, I like them for various reasons. Um, I think where we need a little bit more love is on our corridors, um, but can't pick one spot that looks better than another. Okay. I want to stick with you for a minute because there's a question from the audience that directly relates to you. And the question is, who controls the urban design in the city and who should control the urban design process? 
Well, the urban design process sits in two arenas. One in our historic district, our historic uh, in our historic districts via our historic preservation office in the office of design. And then it also um, resides in the zoning ordinance because at, over the years, probably since the first special public interest district was created and the first quality of life district was created, the city started down a road toward cr making better spaces. Um, and each time that we um, write a new regulation, that regulation is supposed to be better than the other one to make better spaces for people that live here in the city. Okay. And my next question is going to be directly for, um, in particular, Stephanie and also uh, Ellen. The next question is the following for both of you. Can you recommend one thing we can do now to impact urban design in Atlanta? <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of things we could do, but one thing we could do is in every single project go above and beyond uh, our stormwater uh, mitigation requirements, right? We're going to get bigger and bigger, um, you know, rain events. Um, we might as well build in that extra capacity now so that we don't wait till we have, you know, another big storm come through and then try to figure out how to deal with it. So that's an easy thing to do in that um you, you, every project has to manage stormwater, and you could just up that a little bit. Okay. It's not an easy, at all easy thing to do, but I think the thing we most need to do <coughs> is absolutely recognize and value what we don't want to see change, such as the big, those 200-year-old oaks. But we, the harder part is envisioning change in the places that really need it. And so I had decided years ago to really focus my efforts on you know, excess parking lots and aging commercial or industrial properties that are no longer serving the use they once were and figuring out how do you redevelop, re-inhabit, or re-green them. And change is still often, even on some of those sites, a dead strip mall or just a, a, you know, a, a, a pretty much dead business, but it's still got acres of parking. And it's rem remarkable to me still how many obstacles are in the way for change where where it's actually that's where we should be absolutely embracing change and really addressing the big challenges ahead whether it's climate change whether it's equity whether i mean we need to do all of the above and supporting an aging population reducing car dependency etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. okay and with that i want to stay on that because one of the questions we have in particular uh, from the audience, actually, is first for Oscar and then Kieta, then for the rest if you want to answer it, which is how can we plan for density with tree canopy? Again, how can we plan for density with tree canopy? Oh, boy. This is great. Thank you very much for this question. Um, let me first begin. Um, in the Is that the city of Atlanta... In my opinion, this is my opinion. I'm a free spirit. You know, I'm, I mean, I don't work for the city. I don't. I, and I don't work for anybody except my own self. The city of Atlanta needs to have a higher value systems. I don't know whether the value systems are in place, but the value system of if. Atlanta really wants to be a great city, and that's a big if, then it needs to look at the canopies and treat them with a great amount of respect. When you see a tree that's uh, four, 400 years old, nine or 10 generations of us has passed that tree. They could have cut it down, they could have done, they could have lumbered that tree, but that tree is standing. And just because a developer wants to come in 
And usually they strip cut the site, no matter what they say. And they're gonna strip out all of the, all the trees that are gathered together underneath the ground. They're hugging each other. The root systems go all around. And trees been there for 200, 300 years. They're hugging each other, you know. Um, so a developer always comes in, oh, we're not gonna. They'll come in and they strip cut the site, tear it up, bulldoze it down, hell with the tree, and put in their development at a higher density that was with the previous zoning. Now, I am a proponent for R1, 2, and 3. Don't change the zoning because it's the best property in Atlanta. It's R1, 2, and 3 for residential. So there should be no changes to the zoning. Thing. And it's disrespectful from my position when an MPU of which we all are part of, when an MPU says they don't want to have more density and the city pushes it anyway, they're not listening. The city doesn't listen. I'm a, I'm a component, uh, believer that the NPU should be stronger and have much more uh, power and that monies go to them to do some planning what each NPU would like to see in their own community, not in a dictated situation. So um, how to do it? Like I'm just saying, keep one, R1, two, and three, don't touch it. 97% of all those trees are in private ownership and you don't rezone it. So that's the best preservation that okay. I could think of. Oh, and by the way, where all these trees are, in my community, we have burial grounds. We have the Civil War being fought there. We have all sorts of history. And it has to be respected. And it's not being respected, in my opinion, at this point. OK, hold on. We're going to get to that at the end. Kiata? So what um, myself and my coworkers do on a daily basis is balance the interest of all stakeholders in the city, that being those who are residents and those who are property owners. Um, the property owners, of, uh, just like homeowners or corporate owners, are all protected by our U.S. Constitution. And um, there are there is the, the ability for someone to do with their property within certain regulations that the city offers to either change the zoning on their property or to develop it as they wish. That decision to rezone a piece of property may not always be what a resident or an adjacent neighbor in a neighborhood or an MPU wants. However, it is my job from a technical perspective to review that application and provide a recommendation and then our city council then either approves or denies that application. That does not mean as a person, an individual, that I don't like trees or that I am pushing density or that any of those things are true, it just means I've done my technical responsibility to the city as well as all of my other coworkers. I can say that there that we and as the part of the 2.0 team have recognized that there are many things that we need to put in our code that is better. That is one allowing density to to increase here in the city as well as preserve trees and other things and ma maintain property for stormwater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. Which is why we're in partnership with all of the other departments, ATL DLT, uh, watershed public works, all those other departments have to opine because they also are beholden to regulations, right? So in 2.0, there are regulations that will allow someone to amend or reduce their setback by administratively to save a tree. There will be regulations with regard to properties that allow ADUs to move the ADU based upon the saving of a tree. Um, there's also other regulations that we're considering that will be in a part of the TPO and the update to the TPO. So all those things are in the works. Um, we're also considering um, other zoning districts that allow density bonuses and all other types of things related to increasing of density. And then we are also promoting, as we've always promoted, increasing density on our corridors, on our major corridors, Cascade, Moreland, Metropolitan, et cetera, where there are less trees yeah 
um, now, less trees now, because they're serving major uh, parts of our city, major major corridors of, of the city, um, and increase in density in those areas, and as well as putting transit in those areas. Oh, I'm sorry, Kieta. Just for the sake of the audience, I know you use a lot of abbreviations. Can you explain to people a few of those things that you mentioned? Because it may be the first time they've ever heard them. ATL 2.0 is the nickname for our zoning rewrite that we have been in since 2021. If you have not been to a meeting, the next meeting is December the 4th. It is a hybrid meeting. Please make sure that you join in. Module 2 will be dropped on December the 4th. If you've not made any revisions to Module 1, please do so. That's a little plug for my 2.0. Okay. TPO is, is Tree Protection Ordinance and ADU, ADU, accessory dwelling unit. Okay. Uh, and so for Ellen and Stephanie, I see you all kind of itching. Do you want to uh, join in? And um, Oscar, I absolutely love the trees too, but we have a mismatch between our population, that just the demographics. Uh, I don't know, I, maybe Kiata knows the actual stats for uh, city of Atlanta. In the US now, 52% of households are one or two persons. We will be more, we, we will have more people over age 65 than children in the country in 2030. We are just, it's a changing population. And those single family R1, R2, R3 neighborhoods and homes could support more households at a time of an affordable, when we have a dire affordable housing crisis. Okay. And the example, one of the photographs, right there, actually, I, no, I think I saw it just a minute ago in the slides, um, was the Finley Street Cottages, which preserved the, two, the existing large trees on the site of two homes with two, what had been single family bungalows that were both, they were both converted to duplexes two tall skinny duplexes were inserted in between them, four ADUs in the back, and two little tiny cottages around a shared communal yard. When didn't require a variance, thank you, Kiata, I think those, it's, that's where it's good design is actually making it work. It's a rare example, but it's really a fantastic one that I think Atlanta should be proud of. Okay. Stephanie or Oscar? And Oscar, you'll take the last word. Stephanie? <laughs> so, I, we, I'm real. Last time, no, I'd like to take a different, a totally different point of view. The last time that I looked, Atlanta is a flat, is a flat city. So, there's plenty of places to develop housing. And, but you don't come into the center of a green uh, R3 space and start increasing density within a R3, which is the critical uh, lungs of Atlanta. Go outside and do what you're doing in the suburbs, it's fine. You know, okay, so we're taking a little bit of a tangent, and for some people here who may not understand kind of the conversation, a little bit of the tension here, uh, one, does anybody want to first let people know what a R1, R2, R3 is? Sure. R1 is the largest zoning district in the city of Atlanta. It's a two-acre lot. So it starts at two acres, and it goes down to R4B, which is a 2,800-square-foot lot. So those are all the single-family districts. They all have a certain lot size. R1 is uh, two acres. R2 is an uh, acre and a half. R3 is, is one acre. Uh, R4 is... Um, 9,000 square feet, R4A is 7,500, and R4B is 2,800. So all those are all zoning districts, single family zoning districts here in the city, and they all have a certain lot size. What Mr. Harris is talking about is R1, R2, and R3, and they are the largest lots in the city. They are mostly in all of northern Atlanta and in southwest Atlanta um, is the areas where you find most of those lot sizes because those are the areas that came into the city when we annexed in 52, am I 52. right? 52. 51? 61? 52. 52? in 52, um, but the older part of the city, so everything on the east side of 285, the older part of the city is either R4, R5, um, or even smaller than that from a designation that doesn't really exist, maybe a 5,000 square foot lot or a 4,000 square foot lot. They're really smaller lots. Um, and it, so that really it makes our city distinct, which goes back to my comment about our neighborhoods are really unique and pretty. Um, so that's what we're saying when we talk about R1 and R2. Okay. Steph? 
I want to answer this a totally different way. So we talked a lot about our, our kind of our one, two, three. Um, but when we think about even more dense development, you know, say our, our, you know, downtown districts, how do we preserve tree canopy there, I think is another question that can be uh, perhaps easily, more easily addressed, um, which is, you know, we need to make sure that in our codes we're allowing enough space for the streetscape as a whole. So when you look at longevity of tree life, um, trees, big canopy trees want something like a thousand cubic feet of soil. And when they're planted in little, you know, three foot by 10 foot strips, they're not gonna live long and they'll start to buckle the pavement and then they'll get cut down and then we put some new ones in. And so um, if in our codes we can start to require that developers are installing these, um, you know, cellular systems under pavement that provide uh, the, vo the volume we need for canopy trees, that lets us to ha have those trees in those really dense environment. Okay. And for my panel, the next series of questions are directly related to the South Side. So I'm assuming we're going to assume South Side means two things. In the context of this, the South Side being the South Side of Atlanta, and then South Side meaning broadly the South cultural side of Atlanta. All right. So first question is, what are the urban design elements needed on the South Side? Again, what are the urban design elements needed on the South Side? Actually, the urban design elements already exist. It's just that the south side of Atlanta hasn't developed at the same pace as the north side. The zoning districts are exactly the same and the requirements are exactly the same. We just are not seeing development on the south side at the same level as we've seen it on the north side and the east side. Okay, anybody else? Right, and I agree. And that is the inequality in design, which you just heard, that's the inequality right there. And it's big time. It's not small. So I'm not a spokesman for the South Side. I'm just my own spirit, you know. But all I'm saying is more planning, empowerment of MPUs on the South Side to get what they want to have done. Cascade Road that I don't know, it's a DOT, I guess it's it's very, very slow. The business at the point are going to go out of business because they're going to tear up the streets in front of there. The coordination is very poor. Um, we need a lot of attention. And when you use the word design, you say design. This is urban. Let's see, the word urban is supposed to be uh, something scary. That's urban. You know that, that word urban, it's scary place you don't want you know, urban and then we have design connected to it so design the problem is you have to have and you got to think before you have a design so in the thinking we want to get money for the thinking processes and planning for the self size we can coordinate all of our pathways our, our green space and all of that on the water side my approach to water is leave the water run where it runs naturally. It's going to go naturally down the creeks and everything else and don't come. And uh, we had a developer come and want to put a, put a, put a 15-story building on a basin with the Utoy Creek. That's a water basin. Those areas need to be protected. And I think that the from, and then from the developer side, uh, developers need to be educated ahead of time before they go into a community to know what that community is looking for and what they want, because they don't want to spend a lot of money. They don't want to go through all this process and then find out the big argument. So, uh, hmm. Kiata, yeah, you're shaking your head. Do you want to? <laughs> do you want to interject? So just to, just to piggyback off what Mr. Harris says, developers are, nothing is hidden from developers. All of our plans, our small area plans, all of our conversations are communicated with the development community. Um, and, and you're right, the development community is, um, my, they are misers, they don't want to spend money. Um, I spend a lot of my day pushing developers to do more. The code says this, but can you do this? Well, we didn't consider that because, you know, we only need to do these 110 townhomes. Um, 
well, can you provide an amenity because this is a part of the community that is lacking in sidewalks and we are in sidewalks have become a high priority in the city of Atlanta now. Well, does the code say I have to put in sidewalks? It does. So those are the kinds of things that we go that we that we go back and forth with on, on with developers, and we have that fight specifically in the south side of Atlanta. I've had conversations about what the community does not want, and then when they continue to provide things to the south side of Atlanta that they do not want, then usually you'll find a legislative amendment come out to, to on the south side or citywide to say, we don't want it. That was what happened with um, small discount variety stores. That's what happened with gas stations because they continue to bring those types of uses to the south side of Atlanta and those are not things that are, are currently needed. I mean, they're not bringing or adding any value to the city on the south side or the north side either for that matter. And so I don't want it to be lost on anyone that the city of Atlanta staff is not having conversations with developers to move urban design forward. We've even had conversations about adding additional open space on the ground floor or even on an upper floor if it happens to be a multi-story building, but we always get, it doesn't say that. I can tell you that 2.0 will say that. Okay, uh, just quickly, Ellen. Very quickly, 52% um, of trips in the U.S. are three miles or less. That could be a pretty comfortable bike ride for people who are able to bike, a very comfortable bike ride for, for people who are able. Um, Kiata, can we, what do we have to do to get sidewalks to be in the code? So right now, sidewalks are required if you are, if your property is R4, R4A, or R5, or any of the other commercial residential districts. They are not in R1, R2, and R3, but that was that was the compromise. We would not require sidewalks in the larger districts. Um, we, if you do an addition to your property, or if you do um, add an, an accessory dwelling unit to your property today, you are required to install the sidewalks as well. However, there's a provision in the code currently that says if there are no current sidewalks on your prop on the properties on your street, then you don't have to install them. That may be an amendment in the rewrite because we want to increase sidewalks. But we also have an intersection between between sidewalks and trees. And a lot of times, if there are trees or the critical root zone will be, in, be compromised, if there's the addition of sidewalks, then those sidewalks will not be installed. Okay. The next question I have directly about the south side is a two-part. One, how can policy combat food deserts on the south side? And two, how can policy help reduce travel time to amenities? To anyone who wants to answer. As far as the food, all we need to do on the south side is get a Trader Joe's. <laughs> or all we have to do is get a Sprouts. Sounds we'll easy, the, but Oscar, how do you do it? Hey, just get together, you know, get together. Get the people together and, 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 and see what's going on, you know? The development community says the only way that we can get a Trader Joe's or get a, a Whole Foods or any of those nice, fancy, schmancy uh, grocery stores is if we have the rooftop. And the only way that we have the rooftops is if we increase the okay. density. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, we'll come back to that in a second, please. Panel, anybody want to answer? answer? Well, that does sort of link the questions a little bit because, okay. yes, to get the amenities that one needs, one does need the density to support for the catchment area for different kinds of retailers. And retails, even when a city does, when the city, Atlanta, uh, subsidized bringing a grocery store uh, it, closer into um, the on the south side. I mean, they walked away after a year and a half or so. I mean, a ridiculously short period of time. It's yeah, okay. exactly. Ella, but the more people. The north and south is one, 2.5 to 1. Okay. The income is low. So. You're out, yeah, yes. The, it, you do need, mo that, yes, to get the grocery store, the fancy schmancies, they're definitely looking at what, are, what, is the, what is the incomes as to whether or not they'll come into an area, and all retailers are. I was getting to that. Okay. 
You oh. also have to, to attract the, f there's different ways to increase uh, incomes, and one is certainly jobs and wages, but it's also attracting folks in with higher incomes with the amenities. So there's a, there's a circular. Hold on one no, second. No, if you're building new, it's not displacement. Hold on, Al. Hold on one second. We have a question for this gentleman in the hat. Okay, so I just want to make sure, and I don't mean this with no disrespect. What is the question? No, what is the question is what I'm asking. Oscar. Yeah, one thing I'd like to say, you know, I've been around a little while and I practiced a little while and I've been in my house for a little while, like 50 years in one house. I live on the south side and here it is. Developers don't know anything about the south side. They don't want to know anything about the south side. They don't know about running numbers on the south side. They don't know what's going on. The Camp Creek Shopping Center they knew nothing about the area and put that thing together and it's one of the largest grossing shopping centers in the United States, okay? What I'm saying when you talk about design, design means thinking. We gotta have some, the city of Atlanta and everybody need to get together and start thinking constructively in a new way to create those opportunities. And they're there, the money is there. I mean, it would go, but the, but the retailers, oh no, that's the black area. We don't want to go over there. We'll go up here. And it keeps on growing the other direction, which I call a lopsided city. So you can't be a lopsided city. So oh, what I'm Stephanie, asking, do you, I see you were mentioning. Yeah, I've got a, a, a question for my fellow panelists here. In terms of you know what we're hearing is about how do we essentially codify in some way for design, how to address some of these issues. So, um, you know, you mentioned people don't want to put in a sidewalk, right, until you say it's hit, it's written here. So, you know, is there a way we, we could write code, for instance, that requires developers to do an analysis of the area and say, okay, if your project is, you know, uh, further than X distance from a grocery store, you're required to provide food service of this type you know, do we do we think there are strategies like that that could make it into policy that then is exactly what you know you can point back to it and tell them? 
Certainly it could be made into policy. It can't, it wouldn't be able to be codified into the zoning ordinance, but it could be made a part of policy statements. And it's imp important that we're having this conversation here in our, in our plan A meeting, because the plan A meeting is where you put all of your policies and all your goals and your visions. And so that needs to be written into the text so that when we are making policy decisions or asking for grants, it's all written in our CDP and we're using that language to inform and form those documents. And then I wanted to to also add something to what Mr. Harris said, Camp Creek Marketplace actually is a high grossing area. And in order for the city of East Point to, to attract North American to that particular piece of property, they used all of the income information from South Atlanta, from East Point, from College Park and Hapeville. And the combination of all that um, served as the basis for North American locating there. And then subsequently Camp Creek Marketplace um, uh, part two that opened in the city of Atlanta. So it is about having people that are at these arenas re-envisioning re re or reimagining how they calculate the numbers. Because as a resident of Southwest Atlanta, I use I utilize Camp Creek Marketplace and it's, and it's in East Point and I utilize all the things on the South Side. So I'm not just in one location using my using services. And one last question before questions for the audience, which is for all of the panels, if you, feel free to. How do you see regional commuter rail fitting into Atlanta's urban design? How do you see regional commuter rail fitting into Atlanta's urban design? Not all at once. Well, it's pretty fascinating to just even look back at Atlanta at one point had 12 passenger rail lines, you know, just coming into the city, over 60 train stations. Uh, and we are very much a rail city. So there's certainly always, I, and I think there've always been folks talking about, oh, let the brain train to Athens or down to Griffith or, yeah, I mean, there's always been a lot. And yet, what I'm, what, what to me has always been kind of the question is whether is it that outside of Atlanta, does our larger region want the rail as much as we do? Because I feel like I only hear the discussion here. I am a very strong advocate for rail. I think Atlanta, we are adding more and more transit and transit, but it's, we also are seeing just more and more modes of mobility whether that's micro transit. I mean, Gwinnett County is about to vote for, to pass a, a, on a referendum this election to have micro transit zones of on demand taxi vans that could take you anywhere in the entire county. Uh, we've got e bikes are really changing the cycling world, especially in a hilly place like Atlanta. The, there's opera, so I don't, I think. I think there's a lot of interest. Uh, none of us like being stuck in traffic anymore. And I do think there's a lot of generational differences in attitudes towards cars. And a lot of people, when it comes to the urban design, a lot of people just, oh, don't, let, don't take away my parking. Don't take away my, I, my car. But I think actually a lot of folks can get by with one less car and find it actually more affordable, more enjoyable, more if as long as they have more, so many of it, we need every mobility option kind of out there. Um, but I just don't really, ha, has the, I see the rail discussion big in Atlanta. I don't really see it, the region giving us as much uh, discussion at a regional, at that, on that. I think there's all sorts of other issues that at a regional scale, we should be talking about air sh sheds, water sheds, all of those things that are, have nothing to do with political boundaries, but that we are part of this much larger ecosystem. Anyone else? I think unfortunately, sometimes our political boundaries um, don't serve us as well as they could. Um, with regard to transit of any type, it is baffling to me that we, we, the city of Atlanta, got a transit grant at the same time as other major cities, and ours doesn't go as far as other major cities. Like, you go to Washington, D.C., and it's phenomenal where you can go. Um, and then that we also don't have 
commuter trains going from Atlanta to Columbus or to Savannah on a daily basis. Why that ha has happened, I can only think of people having, as Mr. Harris said, a negative connotation to what urban means and what transit means. And until that mindset is changed in this state and in this region, um, I think we'll be far behind with regard to transit. When I first came here, I came here in the 70s. And I worked in the conceptual design of the MARTA system. Uh, so how it's laid out, where it goes, you know, uh, and it's always been this thing about the, the, is that the suburbs don't want the MARTA system to come out uh, because they don't want the people that are on the MARTA system to come out into their space, I think. That's probably it. And I think it's difficult um, when, when, uh, when a city has grown from being a center of transportation, and I consider Hartsfield Airport connected into downtown, I'll connect that into downtown and get downtown. When you're out here in the outer parts, it's very nice out there. I like it out there. It's very nice. Uh, however, for transit, it's terrible. I couldn't imagine living out there and have to go to the airport. You know, I go to the airport 15 minutes. And uh, so there, there will be those people that want to get out there. They have a lot of money. They can be out there. But uh, I think that uh, we need to work on our pathways and walkways. On the south side, we have a whole lot of pathways, but they're not hooked up together. They're not connected. Things are not connected. There's no, there's no real plan. And that's what we need is plan. We need money put into the plan. You know, we could put into a federal grant. Yes, sir. And there's actually a plan underway right that's now. One, two, <laughs> there's a plan underway, okay, right? Uh -huh. But a plan for that community that we can make things work because we have trails going anywhere, but they don't connect. It's crazy. Okay. This question is only for Stephanie, and then I see we have two questions from the audience. So, Stephanie, this question is for you directly. One, why is everything being built? looking all the same and what can we do about it i don't know if this is uh, about um housing uh, but when i hear that question i think of housing and you know you see these apartment buildings pop up and they all have the same like stupid little in out things and and you're like why this is placeless this is soulless uh, i think the answer has got to be money um is that people are often going for the lowest uh, common denominator and so um you know how do we how do we encourage some specificity, um, some memorabilia, memorabil memor yeah, I don't know the word, the ability to have a memorable space, I lost it. Um, you know, in, in the way that we have development um, coming up in Atlanta, I think, I think we, need to, we need to make sure that we're not getting the same over and over again. Okay, and I saw a question first from the young lady over here. Um, so tr uh, parking will be based upon um, several factors um, and based upon where you are in the city, there may be a level of parking that's different than other places in the city. That will all be explained in detail um, with a map and with uh, a terminology in module two. So I don't wanna give too much away because I'm not introducing it to the entire city and I made a commitment that I'll introduce things all at the same time for everyone to hear it at the same time, but it will be based upon certain areas and certain criteria. 
Um, as a, a, I can tell you this, that the city has moved, is moving more toward parking maximums and eliminating parking minimums. Um, you've seen that in legislation that was adopted along the Beltline. You've seen it in legislation um, with regard to proactive rezonings that we've done. We've done parking maximums. Um, and so in there are little small spaces where we have done parking maximums. Also, we did parking updates in our quick fixes. So if you're within a half a mile of high capacity transit right now, there is no parking requirement. If your building is over a certain age, there is no parking requirement. So those are the minor things we've done with related to parking. And as we progress, we have been actually have been getting more robust mm -hmm. with regard to parking. Okay. I'm a man in a bucket hat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to answer your question, which is really to say that's actually exactly what urban design does. Urban design is drawing, a lot of what urban design is, is producing drawings that help you envision what is actually changing. Here's the before, here's the after, here's how it works, here's how, you know, what's, uh, what's changing. And it's, I think it's always hard for all of us to imagine things that, you know, we're used to what we know, and it's hard to often imagine change. And, there, and there's a natural resistance. You've see, we've all seen so many things that we really hated, <laughs> that were, whether it's the, the, build, the apartment buildings that all look alike, or the, the new stuff that doesn't seem like it's adding value, it's just, it's, it's actually hurting what I love about the city. And yet, I think good urban design is actually can able to show the capacity for change and how to address all of these problems. And I would just, you know, really uh, put a little plug in. You know, Ryan Gravel was a Georgia Tech student when he came up with the idea for the Beltline. And he, at this point, he's actually really pretty upset about all the gentrification, all the displacement. And he's like, wow, I almost wish I had never come up with it. He's quite, but, and he, and he were, but, and the city at the time, the city didn't feel there was a need to have anti-gentrification policies. At that time, the city was losing population and wanted more, you know, more people. It wasn't seen, now the, now the, the city is doing a, a much better job, and I think the rest of Atlanta can learn from how the city is really actually 
combining design and policy and anti-displacement policies to try to mitigate the negative sides of gentrification. Uh, but there's a lot that we just couldn't imagine until somebody's drawn it and discussed it and presented it. Um, so that to me is what good urban, okay. good urban design try, at least takes on those questions. And I will tell you, this, there's a next generation of students out there that can blow your minds with really, they don't all want to have cars. We are building car-free communities and my students want, that's what my students actually want to be designing with transit, with bikes, with all the, all the other modes. Okay. Uh, I know we have time, but our panelists will be here for you guys for one-on-one -on -one questions. I see my lady, if you would love to come up with us. I do, just because of time, I do know we need to officially end, but we will be here to, to have questions and more talking back and forth with everyone. So once again, thank you all our panelists for showing up today. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And we're gonna pass the mic. Give it up for the panelists. Thank you, and thank you all. Really good questions, good hard questions. We, we do not shy away from them. Um, we do have an upcoming meeting on Tuesday, economic development, so we actually will have Invest Atlanta moderating that. So if you wanna talk about more about grocery stores and wallets and neighborhoods, that's economic development next week. Uh, historic preservation is our November meeting, so if you're interested in historic preservation, check out that meeting, and then transportation at Lee and White would be a great conversation in December. We will be posting the revised comprehensive plan like in the next week or so. Everyone who signed in will get an email so you can provide your comments and questions and like, you know, what you like, what you don't like, what you're seeing in the policies. Feel free to drop those comments in. That um, draft will be available for several months and then another draft will be out in March after this cycle of meetings. So there'll be plenty of time to provide comments. And if you're not involved with your neighborhood group or your NPUs, your neighborhood planning units, please do. This plan goes through all 25 NPUs before it gets to council. So if you want your uh, opinions heard through your neighborhood, go to your NPU meetings, please. That is the great place to uh, spend time on whatever night they meet. Yep, so we will have, um, we document all of our comments every meeting, so if we didn't get to your questions, we collect them, they're part of the comments, they're part of the things that we review to make revisions to the, the policy. So please, if you wanna drop a comment on the board on your way out, please do so. But thank you all so much for your time tonight. And again, thank you for your questions and comments.